It's for the children, right? Yes. So if they worthy students. worthy students, so that chil uh, children that have uh, can have the ability to receive a, a, a education within our school systems that are outside of the regular world. <laughs> Let's see, is this on? Okay. How nice to see all these boys and girls here. Do you know how much Jesus loves children? Jesus really loves children. And do you know how much the Rogers Church loves you children? We really love children in our church, and we're so glad to see all of you here today. So I'll tell you a story about a dog. This Annie had a little dog, and she grew up with him. Wherever she went, the dog went. If she went to town, the dog went to town. She went to visit the visitors, the relatives, the dog went with her. She went to school, the dog went too. They had to keep him out of the classroom. They had a little trouble with that, but he would go uh, to school as much as he could. And so she had a, a good time with this dog, and everywhere she went, the dog went. So one day she got up to go feed the dog, and there's no dog. No dog. She just wondered, well, where is the dog? So she said, Mother, I'm going to go look for a dog. Mother said, no, wait. 
one more day because maybe the dog will show up tomorrow morning. So she waited a long night. Next morning, no dog. She said, I'm going to go look for the dog because I know where he likes to go quite a bit. So she got on a little path and she went down there. And then she said, I don't see it. She'd been hollering, rover, rover, but no response. So she said, I'm going to go 300 more steps. And see, she went three, 100, 200, 300 steps. She turned around. She's just going to go home, and she heard a little whimper, a little whimper like somebody was hurt. She thought, I'll find out what that is. So she ran over there, and sure enough, it was her dog, and he had his paw caught in a trap. Somebody set a big trap there. So she was able to lift that up and get his paw off. And then she had trouble with him walking because he had to hold his paw like this, and he only had three feet to walk home, but they made it home. Another time she was on the path walking up, and she looked over there, and she saw some pretty yellow flowers. Now, you remember Mother said, don't leave the path. Why? Didn't want her to get lost, right? But she seemed to forget what Mother had said. She thought, oh, those are pretty flowers over there. I'll go get those flowers for Mommy. I'll go pick some flowers. So she ran over there, she started to pick the flowers, and then she tripped and fell down a big long way. She just rolled, 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 and splashed into the water, and out into the water she went, quite a ways from shore. So she started hollering, help, help. There's nobody to help her. But she kept yelling, help, help. But her dog picked up his ear and said, ooh, I recognize that voice. And he ran over there to the shore and stopped at the shore. And he looked out there and saw her. What do you think he did? He jumped into the water and swam out to her. And with his teeth, he grabbed her clothes and with his teeth, held them and turned around and headed back to shore. It was hard for him, but he got her all the way back to shore. Mother was so happy, she fed him the best dog food she had that night because he saved her daughter. Isn't that wonderful? So remember to be nice to animals. Someday, the animal may save your life, too. All right, you go back to your seat. I forgot to mention earlier about a prayer request that in the back of your pew there are some requests. If you have a special prayer request, you can fill one of those out, and I'll be right down front just now and we'll pick those up. As far as possible, please kneel with me as we pray. Our Father in heaven, we come to you this morning on bended knee near thy throne. We ask that you be with us and help us to have a good day and a good, lovely Sabbath day. We ask for a special prayer for these requests that have been given in, Lord, and for the requests that are on our brain and our minds that we have not written down on paper. We thank the members, Lord, that could not be here for one reason or the other. We ask that you be with them and give them special Sabbath days blessing wherever they might be, whatever their situation is. Lord, we ask that you'll be with us this morning as we think about religious liberty and help us all to enjoy the freedoms that we have here and the knowledge that others may not have this freedom and this opportunity. We ask that you'll be with us just now, Lord, as we finish up your service today. In thy name we pray. Amen. Amen.
many of you had a good week this week? Well, the beginning of this week, it was in the it was in the sixties. So me and my wife were able to go for walks in the afternoon after work, and it was just really nice. No jacket, anything. And all of a sudden, bam, <laughs> it goes back to cold. It said, wake up. It's not springtime yet. But this morning, we realized how cold it was. We came up here to practice our singing, and usually people will start showing up, uh, but they didn't show up till the last minute. So when things are cold, it takes a little while to get your motor going and get warmed up. But thank God you're all here. And we're here where it's warm. We're here with the sun, the son of man. And we're ready to sing praises. So the first praise we're going to sing is Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus, which is number 290 out of your hymn book. song, it kind of brings to mind uh, marching, and that's kind of what we're mm -hmm. trying to do. We're going to mobilize to do God's work. So we're going to sing hymn number 647, Mine Eyes Have Seen the Glory. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He has loosed the fateful lightning of his terrible souls with sword. His truth is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory. forth the trumpet that shall never call retreat. He 
is lifting up the hearts of men before his judgment seat. Oh, be swift, my soul, to answer him. Be true, then light my feet. Our God is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. His truth is marching on. In the beauty of the lilies, Christ was born. To make men holy, let us live to make men free while God is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah! Glory, glory, hallelujah! trumpet I almost marched right out of here <laughs> okay let's all stand for our opening song we're gonna sing rise up O man of God and that's uh, 615 not only men but women please rise up O man of God his kingdom tarries long bring in the day Rise up and make her great. Lift high the cross of Christ. Tread where his feet have trod. Disciples of the Son of Man, rise up, O Church of God. You may be seated. Ecclesiastes 1 and verse 9. The thing that hath been, it is that which shall be. And that which is done is that which shall be done. And there is no new thing under the sun. May we each have a wonderful Sabbath day of worship. All right, we're going to have a shared session this morning between Jeff and myself, excuse me, and you. So Jeff will begin, and I'll have a few thoughts after that, and then we're going to give a chance at the end to open it up for testimonies, and I'd like you to be thinking about some things that have been a blessing to you this past year you've been through, maybe thanksgivings, praises for what God's done for you, maybe challenges you face, and this new year, what you're looking forward to, what God may have in store for you or for us here. But today we're starting out with religious liberty, and Jeff's going to lead us as we start looking at that.
test. Mic check. Okay. You know, the, the songs we just sang, very special songs, actually. The second one is actually called the Battle Hymn of the Republic. Mm -hmm. uh, we sang it. What, what was the other title we sang? Mine Eyes Are the Glory. And the first one <clears throat> is very special. Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. When I was a little guy, probably six or seven, I don't know, and my, my dad, we were very active in church, and uh, my dad was a deacon. And uh, he had a revival once. And so as a little tyke, doing what little tykes do, not paying attention, of course, uh, we had a prayer. Well, my father was a deacon, and he had a little film strip thing on the front over there. And he turned on, when we were praying, he turned on the film strip, and there's that classic picture of Christ that old, old picture of Christ. Remember that one? And he put it on the back wall. So I'm in here not paying attention to much of anything, you know. And they say, turn your eyes upon Jesus. And I looked up, and there was Jesus. It freaked me out as a little kid. <laughs> I mean, I wasn't right for a long time. <laughs> so we've got some slides uh, that Nancy graciously put together at midnight last night. Bless my wife. She's, um, she's recuperating from an accident with our dog. Sparky didn't mean it, <laughs> but he tripped her up and she went down hard. So maybe she's watching right now. <clears throat> so the first slide, uh, oh, there it is. <laughs> That's the first slide. Um, <clears throat> this is Religious Liberty Week, and I've held this position at least once before here. And basically what it amounted to was coming up here on that Sabbath and saying about religious liberty and telling everybody where they could donate, and that was the end of it. So <clears throat> this year, God impressed me to do something quite a bit different. What is... What does religious liberty mean? I want an answer. This is going to be a little interactive, so don't be shy. What does religious liberty mean to you? Somebody raise their hand. What does it mean to you? either. She said it means to her that she can raise her children in any way that she please, sees fit. And, and that is liberty. Uh, my dad told me that my freedom ended right here at the end of my nose. Okay? And that, that says a lot. You know, that we don't have the, the right to tell you how to raise your children or you how to worship or, or you how to dress. We don't have that right because it stops right there. So, <clears throat> I want to just read a couple of facts real quick. And this is going to be interspersed with uh, some questions and some facts. And I want to take you on a journey back to Jamestown, 15, 1507, actually. Um, let's do something different here. Jamestown. There we go. Jamestown. <clears throat> In a nutshell, Jamestown was a colony. Uh, that was formed. It was uh, financed by people in England hoping to make a, a profit on the money that they spent to send these people over to the New World that Columbus had discovered 100 years before. <clears throat> Jamestown, actually, let me read something here, which I think is very important. <clears throat> I'm going to back up just a little bit. I want to read to you the Declaration of Principles of the Religious Liberty Magazine. This is actually from their mission statement, if you will. And this will explain more about why we're doing what we're doing. 
They say the God-given right of religious liberty is best exercised when church and state are separate. We know what happens when church and state get together. Look at France, look at England, look at Spain, look at wherever you want to look at. Government is God's agency to protect individual rights and to conduct civil affairs. In exercising these responsibilities, officials are entitled to respect and cooperation. So we do respect our officials. Religious liberty entails freedom of conscience to worship or not to worship, to profess, practice, and promulgate religious beliefs or to change them. In exercising these rights, however, one must respect the equivalent rights of all others. Okay? That's very important. I mean, I might have my own opinion on something, and you might have your own opinion on something, and I will respect your opinion. That's very important. Attempts to unite church and state are opposed to the interests of each. Subversive of human rights and potentially persecuting in character, to oppose union lawfully and honorably is not only the citizen's duty, but the essence of the golden rule, which is to treat others as one wishes to be treated. Did you get that? It's, it's, it's our duty to separate church and state so that we don't have what has happened in the past. Okay, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Good. <coughs> I want to read you a quote. A couple of quotes, actually. <clears throat> Thomas Jefferson, quote, Almighty God hath created the mind free. There's two words in that statement. Almighty God, which he acknowledged, that created our mind to be free. That's freedom. Nobody can tell me what to believe, what to think, or what to say. You can't. They try. That's my wife. <laughs> Benjamin Franklin, quote, highly resolved that this nation under God and government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish from the earth. Gov Franklin. Franklin was a, he was a, a type of a deist. Deist. What does the word deist mean to somebody here? What does deist mean? Okay. Yeah. You believe in God, but he made this whole thing and then he said, goodbye. <laughs> Handle it yourself. That's basically deism. What is theism? Besides being the opposite of atheism. Belief that God does control things and is interested in all of this. So there's deists and there's theists. It's a, it's a mixture of terms there, but they're very important. A lot of our founding fathers were a type of a deist. Um, they believed in God. And like Franklin was, Franklin went to uh, France during the age of reason, around the age of reason time. And when that whole thing was taking place, and um, uh, took some of that back with him. So we're, we're going a little bit further here. And it's interesting that the, that the verse today was Ecclesiastes 1 9, because I picked that. That thing which has been is what will be. That thing which has been is what will be. That kind of says history repeats itself. That which is done is what will be done, and there is nothing new under the sun. I mean, that's genius. And I think you can gather from this that history does repeat itself over and over and over, and that's partly the reason for this little talk today. If you look down history, each of the four kingdoms in Daniel fell starting with moral degradation, then followed with financial greed and finally godlessness. So my question is, where are we today? Seriously, where are we today? This thing, this thing in the front, it says, what does it say? Liberty under 
trial. Our liberties are being eroded. Uh, and we can talk later on about the uh, amendments to the Constitution, specifically the First Amendment, which gives us the right to assemble, to worship like we will, to say the things we do, to address the government for our grievances. These are rights. <coughs> In an attempt not to go down to a rabbit hole here, and that's why I make notes because my memory is not what it used to be. Let me just go back to the beginning, and we're still at Jamestown. <laughs> I'll tell you a funny story. I used to work for NASA years and years ago, and we had to run programs on computer. And I don't know if any of you remembered the old punch cards. Remember punch cards? That's what we ran our programs on. And so they would come in long boxes, the cards all stacked together, and they would go through the machine, the computer, and the big inch reels and all that stuff. And then I would take that box and take it across the base to a, a place where they would run the cards and run the program. So that was simple enough. Well, <laughs> I was walking across grass and I tripped and the box fell open. And the cards went like <sighs> And you have to understand these cards are serialized, but not to the human eye. They didn't say one, two, three, four, five. But they were dot of, of you know, holes in, in, a, in punch card. So I thought, I, I thought I saw how it was. And I gathered them all together, just like these, put them all back together, put them in the box, and took them where they were going. Oh, well, next day, I guess it was, got a call. This program is not running. <laughs> just a little aside there. <clears throat> Here's a few more facts that are interesting before we actually get into the journeys. To pay for the journey to America, the pilgrims took a loan out of 1,700 pounds. That was a lot of money back in 1620. It's, that's true. Uh, and the average day's wage back then was 10 pence. That's like nothing. To repay the loan, the pilgrims signed a legal contract called an indenture, which obligated them to work for seven years, six days a week. That's how they paid for their journey. Think about it. It wasn't a free ride on the Mayflower. And it wasn't a picnic. <laughs> and not only was it not a picnic, but you had to pay for this horrible trip. So August 15, 1620, two ships called the Speedwell and the Mayflower left Southampton. There you go. And uh, heading to America. The Mayflower had 102 passengers. These are just little facts, and I'm going to actually read about the voyage. The Mayflower anchored at Provincetown Bay by journey's end. Two, pa two passengers died, and a baby was born. And I want to interject something here. We, most of us, know that um, James White was a co-founder of the Seventh-day Adventist religion, correct? Did you know that his great, 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 great grandfather was Peregrine White, was the first baby born on the Mayflower? That's facts. And I have a statement here in the White Library. I've done some research on this. I have a statement here that's in the White Library, and I will read it real quickly. It's just a little small. Remember I told you about the computer cards? So bear with me, kids. I, at one point in time, here it is. At one point in time, I ran public meetings for traffic engineering. We had to tell neighborhoods or little old ladies why we were taking their property and making a road out of it. And um, I remember my first one. I was nervous as a cat on a hot tin roof, just about like today. My boss got into my stack of cards, and he slipped a card into one of my, in behind one of my cards. So 
I'm reading from my notes and I'm nervous. And I come to this one and it says, this is from my boss, look out for the tomatoes. <laughs> you have to understand that when you're in a public meeting and you're trying to take people's property away, it's not fun. So look out for the tomatoes. Anyway, so here's a short excerpt from uh, Life Sketches of James and Ellen White. And I will show you the actual letter, which is right there. You can get a copy of it. James says, my father descended from one of the pilgrims who came to America on the ship Mayflower and who landed up on Plymouth Rock in December of 1620. On board that ship was the father of Peregrine, Peregrine White. That's a masculine name, Peregrine White. White wore a pair of silver knee buckles such as seen in the picture of the venerable signers of the Declaration of Independence. <clears throat> the knee bucklers worn by this man were afterwards given to his son, Peregrine White, who was born on a passage to this country with the request that they should be handed down in this line of the White family to the eldest son of each successive generation, whose name should be called John. My father had those buckles for 30 years he gave them to my brother, John, a Methodist minister in Ohio who had passed. Them down to his son, the professor John White of Harvard College. Now I found that absolutely fascinating. Five generations. The Mayflower, by all stretch of the imagination should, should not have even survived the journey. So let me read to you a little bit. And don't get scared, I'm not going to read it all. I need a bigger... Um... Okay, so we talked about Jamestown. There's a picture of the Mayflower, by the way. Here's something that you need to understand. That ship was about 100 feet long. 100 feet is probably from uh, here, maybe to the back door. Maybe a little bit further, but not much more. And the, and the width of it, the beam was about, let's see, 100 feet, it was about, um, I think about 40 feet. So, so probably the ship was starts here, went back to the back, and it was about this wide here. That, and it was a cargo ship. It was not a passenger ship. You didn't get on there because you wanted to go see Aunt Mary. It was strictly a cargo ship, and it was built to hold cargo. And it had different levels, which I think you can see if you look very closely. So there were 102 pilgrims and separatists on board that ship, plus supplies for four weeks to cross the ocean, and then also supplies to build a new home on the new land. The ship was crowded, to say the least. Uh, <clears throat> Let me just read a little bit of thing that came from one of the diaries. It's dark, it smells, it's wet, and it's very cold. There's no privacy, no bathrooms, our meals are pitiful, salted meat and a hard dry biscuit. Think about that, for four weeks. Well, actually, they spent 66 days in the Mayflower. Toward the end of the trip, um, the rations were down to a quarter of a pound of cornmeal per person. Quarter of a pound, that's four ounces of cornmeal. Something else interesting here is that <coughs> of the 102 people that started out, after the, after the first winter, and you have to understand, they, they lived on the ship basically while it was har in harbor. So after that first winter, only 51 people survived. One half of those people died. That's big time. There were 16 mothers on board the ship. Okay, so you'd figure, okay, 16, so half of that would be eight. So maybe eight mothers died. No, most of the mothers died. Why? Why did most of the mothers die? 
because they gave the food to the kids. Think about it. <clears throat> All in search of religious freedom. <clears throat> Psalms 46, 1 through 3 says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the water thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof. And verse 5 says, God is in the midst of her, meaning the church. She shall not be moved. God shall help her, and that right early. Are you getting the picture? The, the deprivation, the privation, the everything was against us. I mean, everything. But we're here, still here today. So I've got, a, I've got a couple of things here. When they started out, it was a speed well in the Mayflower. <clears throat> and he got out to sea a little bit, and the speed well was not really seaworthy, and it started to sink. And the sailors were pumping out and pumping out, and they couldn't pump the water out fast enough. So they hailed the Mayflower, and they said, we got a problem. Because there were also people on the speed well, and then they split it up. And they said, we're, we're sinking. So then they had a big vote, and they talked about it. And <clears throat> the speed well definitely had to go back to port, because she couldn't stay where she was. And the Mayflower was 300 miles out, and they weren't going to turn back. So what they did was, and some of the people, did, and the trip in the beginning was not too really bad. It was the North Atlantic, but it wasn't really into the hard times just yet. But some people wanted to go back home. They changed their mind. So they swapped people on the Mayflower and the Speedwell. Some people from the Speedwell came over. Some people went back and went back with the Speedwell. So... <clears throat> Unfortunately, that overloaded the Mayflower because they had more people. And it was late in the year, and the North Atlantic was fraught with violent storms, one of which nearly sank the Mayflower. It was only by God's grace that they made it to the New World. The ship, after being blown off course by the storms, landed on the shores of Massachusetts instead of Virginia, <laughs> which is where they had planned on. So not only did it take two, months, two weeks longer, they didn't even go where they were going to go. But there's providence in here. This whole thing is God's providence. That's what I'm trying to let you see. It's, it's, God is behind every little thing, even though it doesn't look like it sometimes. And the message to us as Seventh-day Adventists is, you think things are bad now? <laughs> you ain't seen nothing yet. But the good news is, is that God is still behind us. He, he ordained this country, and I think personally he ordained this church. And, uh, so let's fast forward about 120 years after the founding of the 13 colonies. In 1745, France, which was the Catholic nation basically, and Britain, which was basically Protestant, were involved in a war to rule the colonies. Now the colonies had already been established. There were 13 colonies, but they were separate there was no United States. They were all separate countries, if you will, acting on their own. So France owned uh, Eastern Canada, Nova Scotia, and Lewistown, and the British owned and controlled, controlled the 13 colonies. In 1746, France sent 72 ships. Think about that, 72 ships. That's a lot of ships to cross over the Atlantic. 800 cannon and 13,000 soldiers to retake Lewistown and to capture Boston. Boston was controlled by the British. And France said, since we're here, we're going to take Boston too. The odds were overwhelmingly in favor of France. There was a Boston pastor by the name of Thomas Prince. He prayed this very short prayer. You have to understand, the ships, these ships were all out in the harbor ready to come, come ashore. And Prince said, quote, Lord, Send thy tempest on the water and scatter the ships. That's it. So your prayers don't have to be 
missiles, missives. Shortly thereafter, the blue skies turned black. <laughs> and a strong hurricane <laughs> came out of nowhere, scattering the fleet of warships as far as the Caribbean. Whoa. Lightning struck several of the ammunition ships, which had the cannon, and they exploded and sank. Did God have a plan? Fast forward to the War of 1812. Several decades later, after the colonies became a nation, which was a hard enough thing, Britain tried to reconquer the United States. Did you know that? They actually landed, came up to Chesapeake Bay, where I was born and raised, and they went in and they tried to burn Washington, D.C. down. They lit the White House on fire, which was a wooden structure. It wasn't this marble thing and a bunch of the other buildings in the, in the down, federal buildings downtown. Uh, they wanted to burn the town down. Well, here's God again. <laughs> Providentially, a large tornado hit the city, ripping up hundreds of trees and bringing torrential rains, which put out all of the fires. <laughs> Come on. Now, was that coincidence? No. Nah. The constant rain... It's not over. The constant drain, rain, the, drown, the downed trees and deep mud so disheartened the British that they retreated to their ships, which were anchored on the Chesapeake Bay, where I used to go swimming when I was a kid. Undaunted, they sailed up to the port of Baltimore. It was about 40 miles away. Determined to take that city. All night long, they bombarded Fort McHenry, which is a big fort. It had been there off, off from the city, and it was protecting the city. All night long, they bombarded Fort McHenry. Coincidentally, they had captured a Sir Francis Drake, who was a Brit, placed him under arrest, and held him on one of the Brit, uh, who was an American, excuse me, held him on one of the British ships. Drake watched in despair as all night long the fort was shelled. I mean, can you just be standing on an enemy ship watching his country being bombarded? But in the morning, to his surprise, <laughs> the flag still flew over Fort McHenry, and standing on the bow of that British ship, he penned the, the words to the now famous hymn that we know as the Star Spangled Banner. <clears throat> if you want to learn a little bit more about the formation of our country, and I encourage you to take advantage of several items, uh, there is a movie made in 1989 called A More Perfect Union, America Becomes a Nation. It's one of the best I've ever seen as far as the formation of the Constitution and how it n almost never came about. You have to consider that there were representatives from every state. We had what's called the Articles of Confederation, which was prior to the Constitution, which was really kind of a loosely put together document the colonies had started to fight among themselves. It was all about money and trade and all that other stuff. And there were actually uprisings and burnings and just it was just craziness. And this country almost collapsed because nobody could get it together. So George Washington, who of course was the leader in, uh, in the war, in the revolution, and a very learned man, he and Franklin, James Madison, and a few others, uh, cobbled together the um, Constitutional Convention. And they hammered out, it took months to hammer out the Constitution of this country. And it just boggles my mind that this document, written 1789, quite a few hundred, a couple of few hundred years ago, um, is still valid today with only 27 amendments. And the first, the first 10 um, were actually art called articles, and they later converted those to amendments. But only 27 changes to that document, and it's still valid today. One of the amendments was about uh, prohibition, prohibition, prohibition liquor. One was about, um, you have to go in and read them all. But what I want you to take away from all this is God's still behind it. Daniel 12.1 gives us some hope. It says, there will come a time of trouble, such as never since there was a nation. But at that time, Michael shall stand up and deliver his people. 
You know, the people on the Mayflower must have thought that this was the end of them because they were in a horrific storm and it looked like there was no way out. But Michael did stand up for them and sent his angels to give charge over those people and bore that ship all the way to the shores of the beautiful land. And it was at this time that they were rescued. There's going to come a time in which we're going to be facing a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even worse than what the pilgrims on the Mayflower went through. But as our faith is secured in our relationship with Christ now and needs to be so, we can be assured that Michael will stand up for us as well. A couple of more interesting things here. I need a bigger desk. So I want to read one thing, and then we're done. You know, I'd ask God to step in for me and to make sense out of my ramblings. Speaking about the Constitution, does anybody remember in history, American history, ever having to memorize the preamble to the Constitution? All right. We the people. Ready? We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution of the United States of America. We have the longest running Constitution in the world, anywhere. And it's still running. Almost. So... Barely. And in a nutshell, the first ten amendments to the Constitution, actually the Constitution was written in Declaration of Independence of 1776, July 4th and all that. Okay, the Constitution was 1789. The uh, Bill of Rights wasn't written until later because the, the, the people came together to, to do the Constitution. They were away from their homes uh, for weeks and months at a time. It was just such a mess that you, how do we ever get it through? Anyway, the first 10 amendments are called the Bill of Rights. Uh, all the amendments, of course, are important. But I think the first two are what is at stake in today's world. The first amendment talks about freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of religion, freedom of assembly, and the freedom and right to petition the government. We're losing that, folks. It's eroding in front of your eyes. The Second Amendment, uh, which is one of my favorites, it's the right to bear arms. Uh, they knew that the government could get carried away. So I think basically that that's pretty much what I wanted to get you to understand. Um, like I say, I've spent the last two weeks in in heavy research. I've watched four, five movies. I've read, I don't know how many, dozens of articles and did some other research. And I would encourage you to, this is very near and dear to my heart because freedom is very near and dear to me. And I know it is to everybody here, especially people who've served in the military. I know that. Um, the only the only thing that we have to rely on is God. That's it. Because there is no other remedy. I mean, if you have one, raise your hand and tell me what it is. You can't depend on man. You can't depend on the government. You can only depend on God. And it's going to get so bad to where, ah, the one thing I wanted to read you was, this was very serious. Hang with me just for a second. It's right here. I told you my desk wasn't big enough. All right, one more second here. Cat on a hot tin roof. Maybe it's not. Okay, I'm going to just tell you that in a nutshell. I'm going to paraphrase this thing. 
I'd like to read the actual statement. Here. <laughs> Thank you, God. All right, this is very important. your fingers can't feel anything, it's kind of hard to turn pages. All right. So, you kind of learned a little bit where we came from and how we got here, okay? The Washington State Board of Health may soon, this is on the web, this is, you'll get it, may soon amend the state law to authorize the involuntary, involuntary detainment of residences as, as residents as young as five years old into COVID-19 internment camps for failing to comply with the state's experimental vaccine mandate. Now, this is official. WAC-246-100-040, which has been in effect since 2003, way pre-COVID, may, may that's a word to think about, may authorize a proposed revision to include COVID protocol under the state's Communicable and Certain Other Diseases Act, outlines, quote, procedures for isolation or quarantine, end quote. The measure would allow local health officers, quote, at his or her sole discretion to issue an emergency detention order causing a person or groups of persons to be immediately detained for the purpose of isolation or quarantine. Do you get the intent of that? But it's all for the general good. And those are words you have to be careful of. It's for the, it's for the general good. Be careful. Our, our rights are being eroded. That's why we're here today talking about religious liberty. So I've missed a lot of points, but I think you get the idea. And I'm going to turn this over to Mark, and he's not going to be as verbose as me, I'm sure. And we're going to have uh, some testimony time. Mark? Where's Mark? Did Mark go to sleep? <laughs> All right, well, thank you, Jeff. We've been reviewing history, and for many of our young people, I hope you'll never forget it. And many of us that have been around a long time, we need never forget it because they're important lessons we need to learn. In fact, I guess I'd ask today, well, I could ask this, they don't probably, but how many of you are thankful for religious liberty where you live in this country? Hmm? I see a lot of hands. And as I heard Jeff speaking, I realized three things that I want to just summarize sort of. The USA, the United States of America, of which we're a part, were founded on principles of religious freedom never before seen or embraced by a country in the history of the, of the world. And of course, that leading was nothing that man could have done. Only the Almighty God could have done that. Of course, we can look back and somewhat find a parallel in that God led a people out of Egypt and he was going to establish them in a land called what? Called Israel. And we're going to be his people. And that land was given to them for a purpose. What was it? To selfishly hoard it to themselves? No. It was to be a light to the nations around them, to share that what God gave them. Unfortunately, that experiment never really reached its full potential. In Solomon's time, it was an incredible testimony for a brief time, but the large span of its history was times of failure and sorrow and nations that was punished. And so that experiment didn't fully play out. But I kind of think of the fact that God turned back again, and what has been, our text said, will be, he rolled out another experiment in the founding of this country, the United States of America. It was providentially, and it was miraculously established by God. That's the second thing. First, it was set up on religious principle freedoms that we've never seen before happening in a nation. It was miraculously and providentially done by God. And thirdly, it involved the sacrifice and belief of people who are willing to die for those convictions. That's pretty impressive. I don't know how many of us today would be willing to die for the principles that we live on and we stand on. That test is coming, as Jeff was reading about. And so there's a lot more that could be said on that. We're not here today for a complete history lesson, and I don't want you to, we're not getting into 
political issues or nationalism, but we are just reflecting on God's leading in the founding and the greatness and the principles of this country. I hope you remember that. So I want to share with you two things was what I was going to do and then open it up for some testimonies. Um, if you don't mind, Jeff gave us some ancient history. I happen to come across a story that is even a little more current. Uh, I don't think anyone here... Anyone here around when World War II happened? Do we still have any? Huh? All right. <laughs> any other hands who were around in World War II? I, good, I see several. So you can go back and remember those days not too long ago. Many of those born in this century are not aware of the detail and the facts, but we won't go into that. But I came across a story about, because often when God does something, you know, he, even in the Israel's time, they had some punishment coming sometime, that he would punish them, but then he would restore them, give them another opportunity. And a um, little story here about the event that happened that we thought was maybe the end of our freedoms, and that was the bombing of what harbor? Pearl Harbor. Pearl harbor. A day for those that remember will live in infamy. By James L. Hawley. Let me read you an interesting thing just to show you not only did God lead in the path that he's continued to lead. James Hawley says, I have a master's degree in history, and I did not know this. John Guy writes, what God did at Pearl Harbor that day is interesting, and I never knew this little bit of history. Tour boats ferry people out to the USS Arizona Memorial in Hawaii every 30 minutes. We just missed a ferry and had to wait 30 minutes. I went into a small gift shop to kill some time. In the gift shop, I purchased a small book entitled Reflections on Pearl Harbor by Admiral Chester Nimitz. That name probably doesn't mean anything to the young people. Anyone here remember that name? Oh, oh wow, I see a lot of them. Okay. Sunday, December 7, 1941, Admiral Chester Nimitz was attending a concert in Washington, D.C. He was paged and told there that there was a phone call for him. When he answered the phone, guess who it was? It was President Franklin Delano Roosevelt on the phone. He told Admiral Nimitz that he, Nimitz, would now be the commander of the Pacific Fleet. Admiral Nimitz flew to Hawaii to assume command of the Pacific Fleet. He landed at Pearl Harbor on Christmas Eve of 1941. There was such a spirit of despair, dejection, and defeat, you would have thought the Japanese had already won the war. On Christmas Day, 1941, Admiral Nimitz was given a boat tour of the destruction wrought on Pearl Harbor by the Japanese. Big sunken battleships and Navy vessels cluttered the waters everywhere you looked. As the tour boat returned to dock, the young helmsman of the boat said, well, Admiral, what do you think after seeing all this destruction? Admiral Nimitz's reply shocked everyone within the sound of his voice. Admiral Nimitz said the Japanese made three of the biggest mistakes an attack force could ever make, or God was taking care of America. Which do you think it was? Shocked and surprised, the young man asked, what do you mean by saying the Japanese made the three biggest mistakes an attack force could ever make? Nimitz explained, mistake number one, the Japanese attacked Sunday morning. Nine out of ten crewmen of those ships were ashore on leave. If those same ships had been lured to sea and attacked another day of the week, we would have lost 38,000 men instead of 3,800. Mistake number two, when the Japanese saw all those battleships lined up in a row, they got so carried away in sinking those battleships, they never once bombed our dry docks that was opposite those ships. If they had destroyed our dry docks, we would have had to tow every one of those ships back to America to be repaired. As it is now, the ships are in shallow water and can be raised, and one tug can pull them over the dry docks, and we can have them repaired and at sea by the time we could have even towed them back to America. And I already have crews ashore that are anxious to man those ships. Mistake number three, every drop of fuel in the Pacific theater of war is in the top of the ground in storage tanks five miles away over the hill. One attack plane could have strafed those tanks and destroyed our entire fuel supply. That's why I say the Japanese made three of the biggest mistakes an attack force could ever make, or God was taking care of America. 
I've never forgotten what I read in that little book. It's still an inspiration as I reflect upon it. In jest, I might suggest that because Admiral Nimitz was a Texan born and raised in Fredericksburg, he was born an optimist. But any way you look at it, Admiral Nimitz was able to see a silver lining in the situation and circumstances where everyone else saw only despair and defeatism. President Roosevelt had chosen the right man for the right job. We desperately needed a leader that could see a silver lining in the midst of the clouds of dejection, despair, and defeat. There's a reason that our national motto is, in God, what? We trust. Miraculous. I never knew that history myself, what God did just recently for this country. And I think in my closing time, before we have the testimony, I just would like to share a little song with you because let me ask none of those from last century, anybody from that was born from the year 2000 onward ever heard the name of Emma Lazarus? I didn't think so. How many of you born from last century know of that name? Well, I don't see that many hands up yet. She wrote a powerful little poem that became inscribed on a placard that went on the base of the Statue of Liberty. And in it are embodied words that we should never forget. This country was founded as a bastion of religious freedom to open its arms wide to those from every nation, land, and pe people that wanted to come and embrace religious liberty. Just for the interest of it, how many here were born in another country? Could I see your hands? Big up, oh, wow. In fact, why don't you stand for just a minute? Everybody that's raising their hands, I want to see you just stand. Look at that, folks. Praise God. We are not a nation of one blood from born here. We were born from every nation, kindred, tribe, and people. In the, in the church we just were at, who, there was 21 nations represented. I don't know how many are represented here, but these are the people that have come to this country. They're part of a family. Thank God for that. Amen. And they've come because of the words of this song. I'd like you to reflect upon it. If the pictures touch your heart and move you to tears, so be it. It is a reflection of who we have been, who we need to always be. And in spite of politics, who God always wants us to be, reaching out, embracing those that need him in a special way. individuals we must embrace that principle ever and always thank god for that today we live in a land of freedom it's fast disappearing but praise god today we can still embrace those principles let's promote let's share it wherever we can where god gives us opportunity 
All right, we want to take a few minutes to kind of close this service. And I need a volunteer to run the mic. Hey, Rick, you got one, and here's one over here. I want to just take a few minutes, because we are at the, we're just a week into the new year. 2022 has passed. 2023 is just unfolding. Some of you have been through some things in 2022. You have a lot to be thankful for. Maybe you've been through some trials God brought you through. You've been through financial challenges. You've been through stresses and turmoil, but you're here in 2023. And then you're looking ahead in this new year. What do we expect? Only God knows. What hopes and aspirations can we have in our lives? And so I want to just open the door for a couple tests. Perhaps has happened to you in the last year and what you'd like to see happen this new year, experiences that have been a, a rich blessing, and you know there's a God in heaven that's protecting you. So let's just see a hand. If it, all right, let's start. We got two hands. Let's start right over here. I'd like you to give that mic to that gentleman right there for a few minutes. <laughs> uh, Andrew? Well, I'd like to thank Jeff for his feeling patient because it brought some information to me that I never knew. I am French and English, and my family came from the Huguenots. I don't know how many of you heard of them. They were over in France. A lot of them were destroyed at midnight. And James White, I'm a cousin of his. That's not like that's why I'm my cousin. Mm. So it's just really thrilling to me. Mm. Amen. Andrew, right? Yes. Would you be willing to share with us something yes. you shared with me this um, morning? First of all, I'm very, very thankful to be here. Uh, I just went through COVID, and right after that was pneumonia, and so I'm very thankful to be here. Uh, about three, three, was it three point two months ago? Um, the elders laid their hands on me and anointed me with oil. In 2018, I was hit by a truck, and as a result, I developed a condition which I had a really fierce sensitivity to lights. Couldn't go into a Walmart, Home Depot, Lowe's. Uh, I remember when it first started, I walked into a Lowe's, was dead, and the pain was overwhelming and just got so bright, and I just bolted out of there. And after they laid their hands on me, I think it was you, Andrew, because you anointed me with oil. Next day, I thought, well, I don't feel anything. And so next day, I went into a Walmart, and I realized I took the glasses off, and I went, huh. And since then, I haven't had to wear those glasses. Mm. I've been totally healed. Mm. So... Mm. Yep. Mm. Amen. Amen. I think right up here, a sister here. If I can remember everything, wow. Um, what really hit me was the, the women, um, most of the women died. Mm -hmm. And there weren't very many of them either. But they gave their food to their children. And I thought, am I willing, would I be willing in that situation? Am I deeply embedded in Christ enough to the point of that kind of self-denunciation. Mm. It's amazing. But another thing is that God allowed this. When we look at this, we would have looked at it, most likely that God wasn't with us, that he had abandoned us. So we need to really um, be paying attention to our lives and that when bad things happen, it, sometimes it happens for God's glory, not because we did anything, not because we're being punished, but just for God's glory. Mm. But I do remember reading in the great controversy that when the Constitution is dismantled, probation will have closed. Mm. So the drums are really beating in our world. We can't wait. We need to be ready. And not one day should pass where we are not progressing in our faith. We need to do the prayer, the study, the self-examination that we've been called to do. And also, we need to be reminded that um, whatever sins we don't confess now will meet us in the judgment. So, wow, we have our work set up before us, but I really thank God for the inspiration in this. And, um, you know, may God make us all ready to die for the principles, mm. to become one with those principles. So they're so established in us. Mm. And also, we need to remember that God is in control no matter what happens, and that we're not to be established in this world, but we're to be established in the heavenly kingdom. And I just praise God for this church, I praise God for the wonderful people here. 
and um, the open arms that are here. And I want to ask you all to pray for a man at my work. His name is David. I, I pray that he will come to church with you. Mm. Amen. All right. Right in the back there, Rick. <coughs> don't mind us taking a few extra minutes because we don't get to do this that often. And I think it's a blessing to hear each other's stories and testimonies. Yes, Barbara. I try to never pass up a chance to testify for my Lord. Amen. Amen. Two years ago, I started praying for more light and praying for the Holy Spirit to come into my life and possess me and use me mm. in the way God wants me to be used. Mm. And these last two years, I've had more medical problems than the whole time before. Mm. But I have felt God with me. And I know, and like the 10 days of prayer that I joined, and I've started reading the Bible from Genesis through, and I just feel like God is guiding me and can use me now because I have surrendered to him. That's what we have to do. We have to surrender mm -hmm. to him, mm -hmm. and he can use us no matter where we're at. I'm over there in the house all by myself most of the time, mm -hmm. but when I go to Walmart, he puts people in my path. I'm, I'm not, I'm normally a real talkative person here in church to everybody, but I'm not normally that way. Mm. And just last week I was in Walmart and a little old lady came up to me and she was having trouble finding something. And I said, let's find a store clerk, he can help us. And we got to talking and somehow the Lord came up. He always comes up. And she said, well, hon, she said, I just thank God that he sent you in my path. He said, she said, I really need this, and you're going to help me find it. And I said, I'm going to do my best. And she said, I can just look at you and see God's love. And I just thought, praise the Lord. That's mm. what I want. Mm. I want the world to see God's love in me. Amen. Amen. All right. Anybody else? Way up here. Thinking, Barbara, the text, Yea, that I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, where you've been, I will fear no evil, right? Could you with me? <coughs> when my mother was five years old, a call porter stopped in downtown Phoenix, Arizona, and left the Bible readings. Mm -hmm. My mother became an Adventist at 18. Mm -hmm. I was born into the faith, but I left it for many years, going to Sabbath school and church every Sabbath, but still not following Jesus correctly. And one day, God said, it's time for you, Barbara, to change your life, and I'm going to show you how. And for the last 20 years, he turned my life around, mm -hmm. and now I'm out helping other people. Mm -hmm. And I have to share this with you. Exactly... Three months to the day yesterday, I spent three months with my mama and papa and Gentry because papa fell and broke his hip. Mm -hmm. They're leaving now to go to Georgia to a nice care facility by their children. Every morning, mama and papa look forward to morning worship with me. I was a witness to them, even though they're good Christian Adventist people. Papa said, we're going to miss worship, Barbara. Mm. If it hadn't have been for my mom and the old Bible readings, I would not be in the Adventist faith today. Mm. But I'm thankful to God that he turned my life so far around that now I can turn around and help other people. Like the other barber said, I want to be that witness out there in my lifestyle, in my deportment, in what I do. I want people to know there's a God in heaven that will take care of their needs. Amen. You know, if I could say something just a second, I just could off that and go to you. It's interesting. My grandparents on my father's side were immigrants that came through Ellis Island back in the early 1900s. I wouldn't be here today. And my grandma, when they immigrated, they wound up settling in North, the Bronx area of New York. And she was actually being groomed. She was a strict Catholic to become a nun. And an Adventist call porter bless his heart, never know the name, passed through that region and left the book, The Great Controversy, on her doorstep. 
changed her life, changed her destiny, and I'm here today and praise God for that. So, My great-grandmother bought a uh, great controversy back in the late, late 1800s, uh, or maybe early 1900s, I don't know when it was published, but she bought an Ella White book anyway, and that's how she became a Seventh-day Adventist, and that's how every generation since has mm -hmm. been born into the faith. Uh, I don't have words to explain how good God is. Mm -hmm. His provision for me since my divor divorce almost 17 years ago has astounded me. <laughs> he has provided work, a good home, reliable vehicles. Mm -hmm. The last two vehicles that I've owned were purchased and given to me mm. by someone else. Mm. Um, and just this past year, most of you may know that I was suffering terrible pain in my right hip because I had no cartilage left. Mm. For a year and a half, the Lord got me out of bed every morning and got me to work mm. so I could make a living. Mm. Last year, he provided the money I needed for the surgery, and he provided an excellent surgery. And I'm telling you right now, I have absolutely no pain mm. from that. Mm. And uh, it was all because of him. Mm. And I just want to thank him so much for what he does. Amen. 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 Oh. Well, I was thinking about the fact that there was Barbara and there was Barbara and then I'm Barbara. <laughs> <laughs> it just seemed like I had to say something. <laughs> but then Sherry Sh got in there, so I'm not sure I should. Oh, anyway. Okay, so um, I was going to say how history, when I was about four years of age, I was my parents didn't go to church normally, I'm pretty sure. Uh, I just only remember one time being in this very, very small church. It was not even as big as half of this church. I remember sitting in the very back pew, and I was looking at what was going on in the platform once in a while, but mostly I was fascinated with the lights hanging down. My son's listening to this, and he's never heard this story probably. Good thing you're here, Dan. Um, <coughs> those are the lights. I was fascinated with them because... We did not have electricity. And these were electric lights. And we were like, wow, look at those things. Mm -hmm. So that was fascinating. And then all of a sudden, up on the platform went this woman and her two daughters. Kind of remi reminds me of you, Brent, and her two daughters. Yeah, kind of, kind of about that same age. And they yeah. went up there. She played the piano. And the kids sang. And it seemed like... All of a sudden, the whole, uh, and I, I'm, I'm serious, because I was a child, what, 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 you don't, you're not like trying to make something up, but the room was brighter, and it was warmer, and there's something that I just knew that, that felt like there was something different happening here, and I knew in my heart, I wanted to know the God that they were singing about, and I wanted to be able to play the piano like that lady mm. did. Mm. So when you're just little, God can already put a little touch in your heart, start drawing you to him. So that was history. I never started playing the piano until I was nine. I had a piano that when you hit the one key, about three or four of them went down at the same time. <laughs> so my parents were very poor, so they just, like, somebody gave them this junked piano. But... I still learned how to play pretty good, I guess. And so I just see God's hand all the way through that. Didn't come to know the Lord until I was 15, but God has his hand. He guides us, doesn't he? Isn't that wonderful? Amen. Okay. I just got back from um, the New Orleans area on Sunday. Um, I've been gone, I think, about five weeks. Um, I went down to go help my daughter with my granddaughter because she had to go to work and she had to go offshore. And then from there, I went back to go help another family member who I went before to help. 
Um, and so while I was there, I well, when I was down in New Orleans, I fell at my daughter's house. I was up on the counter, and there was she, my daughter had a sign thing up on the top of her cabinet, and it said, thank God for our food and our families and, and how we are blessed and everything, but you couldn't see it all. So I decided I needed to get up on that cupboard and to bring it down so everybody could see it. I got up on the cabinet, and when I got up there, my daughter has um, some trim up on the top, and I decided I was going to be safe. I was going to hold that, and so when I grabbed that, well, and I was reaching down to put the piece of wood down on the counter, it came loose. Well, I lost my balance, and I went head first mm. to the floor, mm. and I have a big old knot on the top of my head, which mm. it still have a little bit. Um, I have a little bit of black eye left. Um, this happened on December 9th, and I fractured my fourth toe, and I dislocated my little toe, mm. and I'm still wearing the shoe for that, and I hurt my shoulder. Well, it could have been worse. I could have been killed, mm -hmm. so God did protect me in that. Um, when I was down there also... Um, one of my good friends for over 40 years, their son died. Um, I, we still don't know exactly what happened, but he was 36 years old, and he used to hang around with my kids, and he died suddenly. He had, they think it was a heart attack, but they're not sure. But I went to the funeral down there, and it was one of the saddest funerals I've ever been to in my life because... There was no service. There was no pastor there. There was no nobody talking about, you know, life afterward. There was no hope. It was just, it was horrible. I, I saw on these people's faces, they, they had no hope. Mm. They, they didn't have Jesus. And I thought, I have known these people for over 40 years. And I didn't become a Seventh-day Adventist till 2015. But I never shared Jesus with them. Mm. And I have a lot of friends down there that they don't know Jesus. And I think this is one of the reasons why I'm down there. Mm. Um, some of them, I can't share Jesus with them by giving them books. But I can show Jesus to them by my example. Mm. So we all have people in our lives that we can witness to in our families, in our friends, from the past and even people that you're going to meet in the future. Do not be afraid to talk to people about Jesus mm -hmm. because time is short. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Okay. It's Religious Liberty Weekend. Yes, it's true. I'm one of the uh, people in this church that uh, have gone over and been part of the military. But that's not really what I'm getting at here. What I'm really getting at here is we have a mission, a mission field to fulfill, a mission field to let the, let them know that the Lord is Lord, a mission to accomplish. We all think, boy, this is a big accomplishment. This is more than what we can handle. It's not. It's not really not. This is a small world, very small world. I'm going to tell you a little story about how small this world really is. Years ago, I worked for a man over on, in Emma Street down in Springdale. And just right on Emma Street, there's called the Old Oak Shop. I don't know if anybody ever remembers that shop or not. But I worked for this man. He was a former Adventist, but he drank and he smoked and had a mouth on him that was three miles long. <coughs> but I worked for this man. And one day, his wife was out between two buildings in the alleyway, and she was hit by a Tyson truck and lost her life. He brought his brother in for her funeral. His brother is still an active Adventist at this time and a pastor. And this pastor, I saw this pastor one time at Billy's funeral. And several years later, went to Washington State and lived up there in Washington State for a while as part of a, a ministry up there. 
And one of the ministry, one of the other people in the ministry asked me, he said, Rick, where are you going to go to church? I said, I have no idea. First weekend there. I don't know. I have no idea. He said, well, come with me. He says, I know this church out here in the woods. So we went to this little bitty church out here in the woods. They had maybe 30 people in the church. I mean, you can imagine, what, three or four pews was all they had in the church. And who should be there in that little bitty church but this one pastor that I worked for his brother for in Springdale, Arkansas. <laughs> I walked up to this pastor after church, and I looked at him. I said, you don't know me, but I said, I know you. I met you one time at your brother, at your sister-in-law's funeral. You had Billy's funeral. Have you ever seen a pastor that didn't know what to say? <laughs> that pastor had no words. <laughs> he just stood there and looked at me. No words whatsoever. A pastor that was speechless. That world is that small of people. We just have to fill our lives with the Holy Spirit and finish it. Right now we have the liberty to do so. It won't be long before we don't have that liberty anymore, and we'll have to do it under great oppression. Mm-hmm. Now's the time, people. Right. Amen. All right, well, I think it's been a blessing, and we probably have more that would like to. I see our time is well past. Uh, in fact, if the rest of you don't mind, maybe we'll just skip the final closing song and have prayer to close our service with since we've been here this long. So I really appreciate those that have shared. I know others have things to share. Maybe we'll do this again sometime. Thank you, Jeff, for the history lesson. And let's pray as we journey on in 2023, no matter what comes, we'll stay true to Jesus and press in close to one another, be part of his family. Father, we thank you this morning. The sun is shining. Your love is still shining upon us. And we thank you for a land in which religious liberty is shined upon. We reap the results of men and women who've given their lives to establish it. Help us never to forget that and take it for granted. But to use religious liberty, not to push, but to invite people to get to know the greatest treasure on earth that's been given to mankind, the gift of Jesus Christ. May he in our lives this week become real, become meaningful, and may we as a small church family push in close to one another, get to know each other, and draw close to each other as we shine your light around us into a dark world. And we'll thank you and praise you. And today in a special way, if there's those that are sick and need healing, we know there are in our midst, though some aren't here, others going through hurts and disappointments that we don't understand and know about, we just ask you to bring your healing love to each and every one of them and help us to reach out and be that hand for Christ, that voice, that inspiration that will be a, perhaps a guiding link to bring them back closer to us. Thank you for your love today and for this time we spent together. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen.